I don't know if uh, I don't know if I can let anybody in. Hey, good afternoon. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late here. We are uh, we are recording the meeting right now, so it is live. No, I can't find anybody. There we go. Okay. I gather we are recording. Is everybody here? I can't see a waiting room and I'm wondering what's going on. Christy's trying a different link, so if, if she doesn't get in, um, you know, we'll be okay, but she shouldn't hold us up at all. Okay. So, I just got right on, but maybe I'm important or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am looking at the agenda right now, and let's do the call to order so that we are official here. And then I would like to call, the, do a roll call of everybody who is here, especially the um, members of the board. And I am Bob Stevenson, Chairman, and I am here, although it says I'm a guest, so at least I'm here. Uh, the next members. I'm Jim Phelps, member of the board. Yes. Peter Russell, Council Liaison. Yes. Uh, Christy, uh, Christy Kiesel, am I yes. saying that right? right? I am here with Paul Wood from GRS Consulting. Okay. And Paul is here. Uh, Sean is here. Point of information, does anyone know if this board has a recording secretary? Um, I don't believe we do. I think Jackie has turned on the recording and she holds those recordings as the minutes. Uh, I, and I, I'm taking I'm taking the minutes right now. Pardon? I'm taking the minutes uh, for today okay. uh, since Jackie's not on the call today. Okay, Sean. Great, thank you. And Shelly Fritz is here. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Thank you. Yes. 
and that reminds me that I have a 515 dinner reservation. So we are ending promptly at five. <laughs> Okay, that completes. And Jackie Lowe is here as uh, um, another staff liaison from the finance department. Correct, Jackie? Correct. And Garrett? Present. Great. Okay, before we go to the new business, I would like to move the approval of the minutes up to this point. Does anybody have any objections to that? Could I get a motion to approve the minutes or if somebody has any uh, adjustments to the minutes, would you bring them forward at this time? Jim Phelps speaking. Um, it showed John Moore as present at our last meeting. He he was not, he's a previous board member, but was not at our last meeting. At least the copy of the minutes that I received showed him as member present. Thanks for catching that. I did not catch that. And I, I saw that also. Find that. With with that exception, yeah, I have moved to approve the minutes. Great. Yes, I see that now, and he was not here, and we should update that. Thank you. Does anybody else have any uh, updates? I believe the rest are here. Do I have a second to approve the minutes? This is Shelly Fritz Pelly, and I will second the motion. Thank you, Chloe. Do we uh, let us uh, any uh, let us any um, let us say all in favor say yay. <laughs> I'll get it out there. Yay. Any, Yay. any anybody disagree with this? Speak now or forever hold your peace. The motion is carried unanimously. Now let us go on to the new business. Um We have a new member, and pardon me, is that you, Garrett? Yes, it is. And I am not familiar with having to swear anybody in. Uh, Bob, actually, I have the um, oath that Jackie provided to me. She wanted me to swear them in on her behalf. Great, great. All Thank right, you. Garrett, um, if I can have you repeat after me, I, Garrett Brooks. I, Garrett Brooks. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Colorado. The Constitution of the State of Colorado. And the Charter and Ordinances of the City of Inglewood. And the Charter and Ordinances of the City of Inglewood. And that I will, to the best of my ability. And that I will, to the best of my ability. 
faithfully perform the duties of the office as a member. Faithfully perform the duties of the office as a member. Of the non-emergency retirement board. Of the non-emergency retirement board. During my continuance therein. During my continuance therein. Okay, congratulations, you are now a member. And I will send uh, this um, attestation for you to sign as well. Fantastic, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Good to have you. We appreciate your willingness to serve. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the uh, consolidation of pension boards. Uh, Sean, was that your report or where are we going with that? This is actually Tamara Niles, city attorney. Okay, Tamara. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, most of you, if not all of you, should have received an email from me regarding a project at the city to consider consolidation uh, or potentially elimination of various boards in the city. Um, during this project, we looked at how many boards the city has and how many boards other cities of our comparable size have. What we found is we have um, sometimes 10, 20 more boards than other cities our size. So we started looking at why. Um, one of the reasons why is because we um, technically have a separate board for multiple different pension and disability funds within the city. Um, those, of course, are NERP. Um, the firefighter pension fund, the police pension fund, um, the volunteer firefighters pension fund, and the police and fire supplemental disability funds. Um, so those are all separately existing boards under our municipal code. Um, NERP is the only board that meets regularly and has um, really worked to develop an expertise in, in uh, pension retirement plans um, and, and you're the only one that's fully staffed as well. I believe you're fully staffed at this point with the swearing in of the new member tonight. Yeah. Uh, and so so it's been difficult for us to get members um, for some of the other boards, especially the police and firefighters. Um, those are called old hire funds. Um, and the firefighters um, code requires us to appoint city firefighters. But as you probably know, we don't have a fire department anymore. We contract with Denver Fire. So uh, we are proposing that um, NERP and the other boards consider consolidating into a single board under NERP. Um, essentially what we're looking at is, or what we're proposing is that um, NERP consider adding uh, an agenda light item for these other boards and possibly adding a few more members, um, perhaps a, a retired, member of our fire fight fire department um possibly retired member from police um and then if any issues should come up regarding those boards then you already have a scheduled meeting and it's already on your agenda line item um what we found is these boards have not met in quite some time other than NERP and so I don't think it uh, will take much extra work on NERP's behalf um but the first step is bringing it to you and, and seeing what you think. Are you open to it? Um, if so, then we will continue exploring it. I will entertain any discussion, but I personally am more than open to it. Anything that will streamline anything in the city and cut red tape and and make things easier to do, I'm in favor of. Uh, I did know some of our former firefighters who retired about the time I did, and I might make some suggestions on that. Rita? Thank you. Um, I, um, Tamara, do you know if any of the those boards have any members? Uh, yes. Um, the Firefighter um, Pension Board has two non-city members um, and uh, two vacancies. Um, the and those are retired firefighters now. Police Pension Board has um, same 
two um, members that aren't city employees and two vacancies. Police Fire Supplemental Board has one non-city um, member and four vacancies, um, including two that are supposed to be elected from our fire department. That's the one that's really difficult for us. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And is it possible? I mean, I know each of these boards runs a little bit differently than this board. And I mean, we have an actuarial um, that I know the police has their own actuarial. Um, and so would all, I, I think we need maybe some history um, before we just go forward with this. I, I absolutely agree that they need um, they need oversight. And, and I think that this would be a great board to do that, but I also think it would be wise for this board to make sure we have all the background information that we need to make sure that um, um, we have everything. Could I make the suggestion, Tamara, that we schedule this discussion for next meeting and perhaps set a goal of uh, accomplishing this, uh, I guess you'd call it a merger or consolidation by the end of the year, if that would make any sense. Uh, that would give us time, Rita, to explore all, all of the contingencies and I think you've probably been doing that, Tamara, but we we need to catch up. So um, is, is there any other discussion or uh, anything that anybody else would like to suggest? Uh, if, if I could weigh in um, sure. in response to Council Member Russell's question, it's my understanding that the other boards um, have not been able to get um, quorums because they haven't they don't have qualified members so the history and and what they've been doing we don't have good records on that because they haven't met in quite some time so it's it's a bit of a, a gray area for us um but i'm happy to get um last minutes and and um any information i can from city staff from our records I think that that would be a good idea. I don't know that I want to wait till the end of the year to do this because um, the lack of oversight on those boards. Um, but I also don't want any liability to this board. Um, so, and I mean, is it possible to schedule an extra meeting um, with you, city attorney? To, I mean, so you could explain to us Well, let, let's look at it this way then. Uh, at the next meeting, uh, we would at least have a discussion and plan on voting. And maybe between uh, who, ho however many uh, would need to have input or would like to have input, we could either schedule a meeting. Uh, I don't know what the legalities would be. Tamara, you can probably tell us on that if we needed to have a meeting to discuss it so that it would be on public record. I would be open to that. If, we, if this was just considered preliminary discussions and we could do it, uh, you know, at, at a convenient time, I would be open to either one. Uh, yes, um, we should do it in a public meeting if it's a the entire board or um, even a majority of your board. Um, the procedurally, um, NERF is not required to vote on it or really even consider it, but before I started working on it more, I, I wanted to get a general thought from you. Um, the procedurally to to make this happen, it's an ordinance from city council. Okay. Um, but okay. city, I don't think city council wants to make you do anything that you don't want to do or that you have okay. reservations about. 
and I do not have many reservations. I I just think that we we need to move forward on it, and uh, I'm. I'm anxious to hear if we have any other opinions on it. I think Paul has his hand raised. I'm not seeing it. Sorry, I'll just, Paul. no Go problem, ahead. just make a quick comment. Um, you know, one of the, um, there's a there's quite a bit of difference between, I think what this board does and maybe what those other boards do, uh, whereas this board is really responsible for hiring that actuary, hiring, you know, invest and investing those assets, whereas, those other plans are covered by FPPA. So they're getting all that administrative stuff is done by FPPA. So it doesn't seem as though it's quite as hands-on, um, you know, for, for this particular board, for those boards that they really, I don't want to say they do anything, but, you know, a vast majority of the, the heavy lift is done by FPPA. And then they provide those reports to uh, the city so that the city knows what kind of contributions they would need to make. We are also the actuary for the FPPA. So, you know, we, we have a pretty good idea of what's happening there. So we just wanted to put that out there. Great. And that would that would clear that up. If you're also the, their actuary, you know, you could report here. So that would seem to be a natural fit to me. And uh, Tamara, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this is only the second time I've heard about this. and. Uh, talked about it, but the police board has actually uh, uh, duplicated the the state. The police are now under a state plan or something greater than that. So that board seems to be rather unnecessary anymore. Am I wrong on that? Uh, so this is called the old hire police pension board. So okay. it's before it went to the state. Um, and and Paul, thank you for your comments because um, that was a concern of mine and other city staff is that city staff gets these reports, um, but we want a board or some sort of oversight to look at it, to look at them and make sure there's nothing of concern. Um, right now we receive them and and that's it. And so we would like to attach them to the NERP agenda just so just so there's some oversight and it's public and um, everything's on the up and up. Great, great. How many uh, old hired uh, retirees are there under that plan? Do you have any idea? Uh, I'm going to ask Sean Weiske if he knows because I don't have those records on me. I, I didn't think you would really, but uh, I'm just wondering because there can't be too many there, I don't think, but I don't know. And I, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but I, I can certainly get those um, for consideration. Great. If you would do I, that and maybe send it out, that would be great. Paul? I can let you know. So right now we've got um, in the old hire police plan, there's uh, as of last year, 33 members, old hire fire, 36 members, and there's also a small volunteer group of three members. Okay, so we're affecting about what 69 members by doing this, correct? Something in that range anyway. Great, that's good to know. Anybody else want to weigh in? Paul answered my question for us, so that would be, I was just wondering how that would work with the money aspect in that. So thank you, Paul, for answering that. Well, Tamara, do you need a motion from us to move forward, or is this enough just to give you the consensus of the of the board? Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable without a motion. Um, I, I, feel like I've received some direction as to additional information you need, and I'll reach out to staff to see if they can get perhaps some minutes of prior meetings of the other boards, uh, if we have any, um, to see um, what type of action has been required. I also do have some analysis from outside counsel. We retained outside counsel to evaluate all of this and, and recommend this, and this is one of the things they recommended to improve efficiency. So um, I will um, 
plan to create a packet of additional information to help guide you. And uh, then if, if you do want to vote, perhaps next meeting. That would seem a good path to follow. Paul, is your hand up again uh, or am I? Great. <laughs> I thought it went off and then I thought come back. So <laughs> great. Okay. Uh, that being taken care of, I would like to uh, go to you, Paul, for the actuary actuarial valuation report. And I think it's plural now. Um, I, I would you just go ahead with that? Absolutely. Well, I know that uh, you know, the chair has a uh, dinner reservation, so I try to keep my comments under an hour and a half. Um, but uh, no, what we're here for, I hope you if, can everyone see the screen just to make sure. I'm not very good at Microsoft Teams, but I think you should see yeah. our presentation. Yeah. Great. So what Christy and I are here to present are the results of the January 1, 2022 valuation. You may think to yourself, wow, that was a really long time ago, and it was a really long time ago, um, but you know, we struggled a little bit with getting data uh, last year, so it set the schedule back a little bit, but it's still important that we talk about that particular valuation because the results of that valuation set the contribution rate that should be in effect uh, here in uh, calendar year 2023. And so Christy and I are going to talk again um, about what happened as of that valuation date, but then I'm also going to talk just for a moment about, you know, what, what happened in 2022 that could affect the valuation that we are working on right now. And so we'll jump in with some of the highlights. I'll go through this slide and then I'll pass it over to Christy to go through some of the details. Uh, but there's a, a couple of trends that are that are really starting to stick out. First of all, active population is continuing to decrease. So we're down to 68 active members. Um, we were you know, well over 100 members a few years ago. So we're seeing this continual decrease in membership. What that typically would mean is that you know, when we do this calculation of a contribution rate, we're making contributions based upon a rate of pay. And so if pay keeps decreasing and we're saying we want, say, you know, 30% of pay, but pay is down 15%, then we're going to get about 15% fewer contributions than we would have expected. And so that's something that we need to keep an eye on. And if it continues to happen, then we may have to talk about some strategies to address that in terms of getting contributions into the plan. So we're really closely monitoring that. In terms of that actuarially determined contribution or the contribution that needs to be made uh, here in calendar year 2023 to the plan, that total amount decreased to 25.2%, down from 30.8%. We net out the employee contributions and we're left with a city portion of 22.2% of pay. So a nice reduction um, year over year. Uh, Christy's gonna talk about some of the reasons for that, but you know, don't get too excited because as we'll get to at the end, uh, because of the results of the um, capital markets in 2022, that rate's gonna go back up here when we do the, the valuation we're working on right now. Talking about investment return, again, very stale numbers because this is actually calendar year 2021, about a 14% return in your market value of assets. So beating your expectation of 6% by almost 8%. So, you know, just a really strong year. And then we're gonna present a lot of these results on what we call the smooth value of assets or the actuarial value of assets. And we expect that asset value also to return 6% and that actually returned 9.8%. So again, another strong year for the actuarial value of assets. Finally, the funded ratio, which is the ratio of our assets to our liabilities, increased to 85.5%. So, you know, again, as of this day, if we were sitting here a year ago having this conversation, we say, boy, things are really looking good. Uh, but again, I just want to temper that just a little bit because we had a you know, really challenging 2022. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Christy to, uh, to go over some of the details for us. Thank you, Paul. So we're just going to jump right in with starting with some of your plan membership data. Uh, really focusing on what's happening with the active members over the year of 2021. Uh, we saw one age retirement, two drop retirements. Along with that, we saw 15 terminations and only 10 new members. So from all of that, you can really see that the rate at which members are leaving the plan is a bit quicker than they are entering the plan, which is contributing to this decrease in active population that Paul mentioned on the previous slide. 
along with that decrease in the active population, we're seeing a decrease in that payroll. So over the year of 20, from 2020, 20, January 1, 2021 to January 1, 2022, we saw about a 6% decrease in payroll. And that is also then going to impact the amount that's being contributed to the plan. As Paul mentioned, the plan is contributed to as a percent of pay. Um, this also includes employees contribute to the plan at 3% of pay. So when there's less payroll, there's less contributions coming in. Uh, so we just really wanted to highlight, again, how uh, steeply that that active population has been decreasing that it was up over at 159 just about 12 years ago compared to 68 members uh, in 2021. So along with that, the uh, average service in the plan is remaining approximately stable. Your active average age is a little bit lower and that's due to some of these new members coming in a little younger and some of those older members aging out. Um, a couple other numbers to look at here, we can just see that those members in payment status stayed relatively stable. So we saw um, about one age retirement from active membership. We also saw another retirement from our deferred vested members. Um, and then we saw a couple of deaths over the year that were balanced out by a few new beneficiaries overall remaining stable. Uh, those deferred vesteds, these are the people that left the plan, that were had enough service to be vested, that are expected to be paid uh, benefits at a later date. And that went up a little bit because five of those 15 other terminations were new deferred vested members. Um, overall, the total participation in the plan remained, decreased a little bit, um, but remained relatively stable. And then at the bottom there, you can really see that that sharp decrease in the annual payroll, even though that average pay per member did increase. So um, on our next slide, we are going to take a look at these market value of assets. As Paul warned, we, we need to tamper the excitement on this slide a little bit. Uh, the numbers were really good. Uh, we came off of two really strong market value years. So 2020, 11.6% uh, rate of return and almost 14% in 2021. We're not expecting to see that. We're actually, uh, Paul's going to be going over this a little more later, but we actually are seeing about a negative 11% return in 2022. Um, so that makes these results a little bit outdated at the moment. Uh, but another couple of key things we can look at on this slide is are those member contributions uh, that Paul and I were talking about is that you can see the member contributions decreased a little bit. That's going to be due to the decrease in payroll. All members are still contributing at 3%, but with less contributing, that amount's going to go down. With that going down, the city contributions are increasing as they're going to have to make up for some of that lower contribution overall. Um, the benefit payments are increasing. Uh, there were a little, few more people getting benefit payments. Um, along with that, uh, some of the people retiring are receiving higher benefit payments. So that becomes a greater need to be able to contribute to continue to pay those benefits long term. Uh, so we'll move on to the next slide which this is our actuarial value of assets. So all of our calculations are actually going to be based on this value, which we consider a smoothed value. So we're really taking those market values and we're going to take any gains and losses from year to year and smooth it over five years so that the funding decisions we're making for the future of the plan are not based on these really volatile market years where we're going from a year of 14% rate of return down to negative 11%. Instead, we're working on this more smooth value where we have our actual value of assets uh, over 2021 returned a value close to 10%. And this is because we are recognizing those gains from actually the last three years of really impressive asset returns, 2019, was about 17%. So we're recognizing a chunk of that in this along with the 11% from 2020 and then that 
14% of 2021 is all currently getting recognized, um, little pieces of it in these actuarial value of assets, which allowed us to have a gain and return 9.8%, uh, a little bit over that 6% as assumed return. And that is that gain of 1.3 million. Um, if we take a step back, we can see that that value is a little bit lower than that 14% from 2021, but it's still a little bit higher than our return. And then what we're going to see moving forward in 2022 is that this actuarial value, although we are expecting to see a little bit of a loss, it's not going to be the quite large gut punch that is returning 17% less than that 6% we were expecting. Uh, so that is really the purpose of using this actuarial value of assets and overall seeing all of those prior gains and getting to recognize them in this figure really helps us moving forward to be able to make solid funding decisions based on a more stable value that's not as impacted by all of that volatility. So next, what are we funding? We are funding this actuarial accrued liability and uh, over the last, well, from <laughs> over 2021, we saw a decrease in that liability from 47 million down to 46.3 million, uh, which was actually about $576,000 less than we expected. And the primary source for those gains is uh, due to some of your withdrawal experience. So we're not seeing people staying in the plan as long and therefore they're not accruing as much liability as we were expecting them to over time, which has been really helpful. Uh, we're also seeing some members that we would be expecting to retire, staying in the plan a little bit long, which means they're continuing to contribute to their um, future benefits and that is helping to decrease some of this future liability. So from year to year, we can see that we've actually seen gains on this, uh, on the accrued liability over the last two years. And that is, it's mostly due to some of those expectations being not exactly as we imagined. So that, that's actually really good for the plan. And um, in a greater scheme of our gains and losses here, uh, if we go on to our next slide, uh, we will see the bigger picture of gains and losses over the year. So in 2021, it was a big gain year on both that investment return and our liabilities. So as we see that investment return was a really, really big part of the gains over the year, that's that 1.3 million gain on the actuarial value of the assets. So that's the biggest portion of the gains to the plan over the year. And again, just to tamper expectations, we're not expecting to see that those same gains in 2022. Um, from, from that last page, we'll see the next biggest chunk is due to that demographic and liability um, gain. So that's just due to membership changing a little bit differently than expected and in favor of lowering the liabilities for the plan. Uh, this last little line item is due to cash flow and timing. This really just has to do with how we are assuming the timing of payments such as payroll and benefits to come through the plan um, versus when they're actually paid out. And so there's just a little bit of gains and losses that we see that fluctuate from year to year, but overall it's a really small piece of this uh, gain loss puzzle to the plan. So. Christy, Chris, I'll just jump in real yeah. quick, um, just to um, provide a little bit of context here. So what this is effectively saying is that, you know, Christy and I, we have these expectations on the liability. We have an expectation on the assets and we do this little bit of what we call like a gain loss report card it says how close were our expectations then can i explain or can we explain why our expectations weren't met it's actually my favorite part of the valuation um and so this is just this is measuring up about against what we're doing and so what this is kind of telling us at least on the demographic side there we have a couple years in a row here where we've seen these demographic gains and it's mainly driven by that termination experience so again we have this like sort of churn on our um 
you know, active member population, we have a lot of people terminating or more people than expected terminating, releasing a fair amount of liability. So what this tells us is that, you know, at some point here, we're going to need to start looking at that termination assumption to see if, if we're being a little bit too conservative with it potentially. Uh, but at this point, not too concerning, um, but something that we are keeping an eye on. Thank you, Paul. Um, so with that, I'll have Paul take us to the next slide, uh, which is really the culmination of our report. And this is really one of the main reasons that we're here today is to give you this information, um, which is what needs to be contributed to the plan and how do we come up with that number. So as Paul went over in the very first slide, the Final outcome here is a actually a decrease in the determined contribution for the city from 27.8% down to 22.2%. And this contribution amount is made up of a couple of different pieces. The first piece is the normal cost, which is the cost to replace each member in the plan. So it's, it's the cost of the benefit for the members in the plan. Uh, this is the value of the benefits. And then we are going to take out from that normal cost, we are going to take out the expected member contributions, which is that 3% of payroll. And then the next, so that leaves us with the city's normal cost. So the part that the city, the portion of the benefits value that the city is providing to the member. And then the final piece is the amortization pay payment. And this is a really large piece. And this is just taking that the unfunded accrued liability, which is the amount that is the difference between our actuarial accrued liability, which a couple slides back we had was about 46.3 million. So we're going to compare that amount, that liability that the plan needs to pay to the actuarial value of assets, which is uh, about 39.6 million at the moment. And so the difference between those two amounts is going to make up our unfunded accrued liability. And that amount, we are then going to spread as a payment over time, and that is going to be our amortization payment. And that created this final number here, which is the largest piece of that city determined contribution, which uh, then gets us to our final actuarial determined contribution of 22.2% of payroll. So then if we take a look at the final slide, uh, this is just really to let you guys know how the contribution has changed over time. Uh, so we're looking at a snapshot of about 10 years here, and you can see that up until this year, that amount has been continually increasing, uh, and it has been both due to the, so you can see we have it broken out into uh, two pieces here. So the bottom piece uh, in the kind of gold color is our normal cost percent. So that's the value of the benefits to the members. And then the larger green chunk on top is that amount that we are paying in order to pay down that unfunded accrued liability. So over the last nine years before 2021, we saw a generally steady increase in that unfunded liability, which also meant that we were seeing a steady increase in that amount that needed to go toward paying off that unfunded liability. Uh, at the same time, we were seeing the benefit value increasing, which together made the entire contribution increase over time. Now we can see this year in 2021 due to really positive investment returns, as well as gains on that liability, we saw a decrease in that unfunded liability, which helped shift that total determined contribution down, which again, to tamper expectations, I would expect these lines to go back up a little after this next year, primarily due to our investment returns. 
However, at this point in time, I can't speak to uh, what we're going to see in terms of liability gains and losses. So that might help here or there. But uh, overall, we, we would expect to see this number rising again uh, after 2022. All right, well, maybe we'll, we'll pause there. And are there any questions on um, you know, either the liability used the assets, uh, this contribution rate? You know, one of the things that goes through my mind when I see something like this is, wow, there's a lot of volatility here. You know, so is there something we should be looking at to address the volatility? Um, we do have some smoothing techniques um, that we're using already, but it just happens when you're coming off this really long string of, you know, decent years, you know, this is a result of, of um, of the funding policy and so the city could look at this and say well maybe we just want to keep our contribution you know up at the level that it was at you know for another year because we know it's going to go up next year or drop it down to that 22.2 percent and then you know with the expectation that it probably is going to go up when we look at the the calendar year 2024 contribution rate but we'd be happy to take any questions before we get to the projection uh, part of the presentation paul yes would the would the council uh, make that decision or approve that decision? And maybe Jackie can answer. Uh, would the finance department actually make that recommendation? Yeah, I'll just give my comment real quick. I think what the 22.2% represents is the minimum amount that needs to be contributed according to the funding policy. Uh, there, I, don't believe there's anything keeping the city from contributing more, but uh, I'll defer that portion of it uh, to Jackie. Um, in terms of formal, formal, for, formal process, I'm not quite sure if we need to get a council's approval. Um, I would say our city's contribution has been pretty stable. Like for 2023, we decreased by $300,000 because the market uh, market performance and uh, the termination of the employees. So I, I cannot answer in terms of formality about council's okay. approval. Yeah, but I do have a question for Paul. What does the UAL stand for? Uh, UAL is unfunded accrued liability. So that's the difference okay. between the liability and the assets. Okay. Yeah, I think council has been approving um, the city's employer's contribution through the normal budget adoption process. Uh, this numbers fluctuate, depend upon the market performance, and it differ again, like Paul um, stated. Yeah, council member Russell. Let me let me ask you this in another way. Is this something that we as a board could contribute to or make a re recommendation to or is that part of our purview? I feel this requires bigger conversation because Paul, you are going to share with us how many years would take city to pay down liability, right? I remember probably 14 to 15 mm -hmm. years. And do we want to pay down faster? Is this necessary? I feel our funding ratio has been pretty healthy. Um, so. Yep. But I just, I'll, I'll, oh yeah, go ahead, sorry. I just would like to share some historical, I, I think the reason Paul is here is to, to inform us and, and let us know. I know that when John Moore was on this board, he was an actuarial also and I think the recommendation comes from the board, what we want to do, how we set things, and then the city has to incorporate that in their budget. So, and Paul, maybe you know more how that works, but I, I think this board recommends what we ought to do. Yeah, that, that's been typically the experience here. What, what we've done is, you know, if you go back and look at some of the history, we've changed what we call that funding policy or the mechanism that we use to come up with this ca uh, contribution amount. And you really do have a pretty strong funding policy. Um, it's something that back in 2020, uh, we put into place where we had a big 
pile of unfunded accrued liability at that time. And we said, we're going to amortize that particular piece over a 15 year period. And so that will be paid off over 15 years. And then each year going forward, if we have these, you know, what we call those gains and losses, you know, so if we do better than we expected or worse than we expected, then that get particular gain or loss would then be amortized over a 10 year period, their own individual 10 year periods. And so the, the funding policy in and of itself is very strong. It's just creating a fair amount of volatility because, um, you know, we're we have relatively short periods, 10 year periods. That's, a, you know, that's one of the best uh, amortization periods that I have as one of my clients. So very happy to see that. But because it is a shorter period, you do get some of these fluctuations year to year. And so if you just allow the funding policy to work out, you'll see, you know, you'll have the contribution come down this year and then next year it'll go back up. And then the year after that, it could start to fluctuate again. But the funding policy, if we just follow it, you know, we're going to get to where we want to go. Um, that's for sure. Uh, but again, it, it, you know, does the city want to contribute that amount? And you know, is that, uh, you know, that that's really up to them ultimately? But I think the board in the past has said we're going to set the contribution calculation this way, and this is what we approve. And then I think the board, the the city has gone along with that, um, and has actually contributed that amount, at least in the history that I've since I've been around since 2015. Great. And I just, I'd like to add to that a little bit. I I do think when the city, because it may have been back in 2020 or 2019, um, when we changed it and the city really didn't have the funds to contribute as much as they wanted, I think the board changed their mind to amortize it over 15 years instead of 10 years. So it's, I think it kind of can be a give and take. Yes. I think from my dim memory of all of the history, I think that is correct. And um, I was following it from afar to put it mildly. So that's what I wanted to clarify. Thank you, Rita. So now can we, are we moving on to this last uh, report, Paul? Yep, you know, if um, yeah, I'll move through this pretty quickly, and then if, if we want, if there's, you know, I know we, we're kind of, you know, getting strapped for time here, so what we'll do is I'll go through it quickly, and then maybe at the next meeting, if we want to drill down and spend a little more time on it, we certainly can. Um, but okay. one, of the, one of the things that I would do want to get, always get across is that these valuations are at a point in time, and so it's just taking the information right on that date, said, what are the, what's the assets in the bank at that point? What does the liabilities look like at that point? And it's very important, but it's also important to understand where we're heading. And so what I did here on this long-term projection is I looked at what the employer contribution rate, how that's going to materialize over time. And I started with the line that I presented last year, uh, which was the 1-1-2021 valuation, which was that purple line. And it showed that we were going to start about you know that 27% rate. And then it was going to come down a little bit, sit around 20%, head back up, and then ultimately when we have all of our unfunded accrued liability paid off, we're going to be contributing somewhere in the neighborhood of eight, eight and a half percent. You know, that's down in the 2036, 2037 arena. The green line is this year's valuation. You can see that it's significantly uh, lower than it was uh, when I presented last year. And that's a direct result of the investment rate of return coming in at uh, that 13.8%. And so what I did, I just recast that, that purple line to say, okay, what would happen if the return was 13.8% in one year, just to show you that there's consistency in the projections and that what's really driving this train here and these projections is that one year's return. Um, in a moment, I'm going to get to what this looks like if we recognize the 2022 actual rate of return. It looks doesn't look as great as here, but we'll, we'll move on to the dollar amounts. Again, dollar amounts are going to be, you know, we're projected to be lower if we had a 6% return going forward. And then when we look at our funded status, and I think this is what's most important. This shows that our funding policy is working. This shows that, you know, it doesn't matter what the investment rate of return is, we're going to calculate a contribution that's going to put us on a path to get to that fully funded point somewhere in the neighborhood of 2035. And so this is just, this is, this helps me sleep at night to say that, boy, we've got a really good plan in place. It's going to put us on a path uh, to being where we want to be in a very, very reasonable period of time. Uh, 
just again to touch on that 2022, um, just as an estimate, uh, I plugged in negative 10.86%. I think that I just received the audited assets um, you know, two days ago from, from Kevin Angles at the city. And the return was actually somewhere like the return that I would calculate was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10.4%. So this is just a little bit uh, more pessimistic than that. But what this is going to say is that we've got this We've got some deferred asset gains that Christy talked about, so that's going to help offset some of this poor performance. But if we don't have any future overperformance, if we don't have anything coming in above six percent, then things are going to uh, that contribution rate is going to tick up quite a bit, and that's what you see here. So the purple line is that the valuation with the six percent 2022 return, and then the red line is the the same valuation line but with the negative 10.8 percent 2022 return. And you can see that. There's going to be this upward pressure on that contribution rate over time. We could potentially eclipse, uh, you know, 40% of pay in 2032. And again, this is absent any overperformance whatsoever. And so that's where we could be headed. Uh, we look at it as a dollar amount um, by 2034, 2035. We could be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 1.75 uh, million dollars as a contribution. Uh, so about double of where we're at today. Um, and then again, the slide that shows our funding policy uh, working as we would expect it to. You can see that that funded ratio growth uh, in the first few years because of that poor return is mitigated somewhat. So we've kind of stayed where we're at. And then we have this little drop off in 2027, but then we're right back on track to get to very close to fully funded by 2035. And again, this is your funding policy at work. That's very positive. It's actually fantastic, I think. Yeah, you know, the board did a lot of heavy lifting the last couple of years, especially in 2020 when we, you know, uh, we, we changed that amortization period to do that 15 year amortization period. But at the same time, we really strengthened our mortality assumption. We went down to a 6% discount rate. You have the, you know, that's pretty much the best discount rate of any of your peers in the, you know, pretty much in Colorado. Um, but certainly in the, the Denver you know, sort of metro area. So there's a lot of heavy, hard decisions that have been made. And so now it's just a matter of let's let this play out and let's make sure that we make the contributions. Let's make sure that we're everyone's aware of where those contributions are going to be. And then you know we can plan accordingly. But we have a plan in place that's, that's going to put us where we want to be. Yeah, I, I think we owe a lot of gratitude to John Moore and Jim Woodward for setting this up because I feel like Absolutely. I can just kind of coast and they really understood what they were trying to do, especially John. Thank you. Do, do you need more time? Are we, where are we? I am all done if, uh, if there are not any questions. Um, Paul, yeah, sorry. Uh, I have a quick question and comment, okay. Paul. If I just want to know assumption you use to do the long-term projection, uh, we are targeting 6% as a return on the actual value of assets, right? And you're thinking you might um, change, the, increase the termination rate based on the, the current situation. And what's the estimated annual salary increase in your projection? Like 3%, yes. 4%, or 5%? Yeah, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, I think it's around 3% is what uh, what I have plugged in there. Okay. And so um, what would happen if, if we don't see that 3%, then we might see that rate of pay increase a little bit higher, but that rate of pay times the slightly lower payroll would end up in about the same amount in terms of dollars. Um, so the, that's one of the nice things about these projections is that you know we do get that give and take there when you, Looking at it, it could be a little scary as a rate of pay, but then when you look at it as a dollar amount, it's much more palatable. Yeah, because we're uh, we're conducting a class and compensation study, so we might change some employees' pay um, mm -hmm. to reflect inflation. So that might be another variable that will play in in your projection. Just want to throw this out. Yeah, and so what would happen in, in a situation like that is we would see these pays increase, that accrued liability number would go up. But then over time, because we're now working off a higher payroll base, mm -hmm. if we get 25.2% of a higher payroll base, we're going to have much more money coming into the plan that's going to pay off that increase, 
that initial increase in the accrued liability. And so it it doesn't end up being a complete wash, but it's it's pretty close to it. Uh, you know, as you ladder out that projection, 15, 20 years. We see the whole thing in a 15 year time frame, not just yeah. one or two years, and then exactly. get nervous. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Jackie. Well, I think we're in a good place. And if we need to drill down more, as you put it, John, uh, Paul, we can do that next meeting. But uh, I think uh, I understand, and I think the board understands where we are. And, and uh, that's the main thing. And we're now caught up, which is even <laughs> better. <laughs> so we know yeah. where we stand. So. That's great. I appreciate all the work that you and the staff have done. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. And if it's not evident, I love to talk. So if you want me to come back in May uh, at our next meeting and talk about anything else, more than happy to. Yes, uh, it'd probably be good to count on that. And then uh, we will, uh, if we decide we don't need to or whatever, we'll let you know. But uh, I think it would be good because we're we're really just getting a snap overview of actually two two full years, so there might be some more that we need to look at. Thank you. Great. Uh, now, I think we need to turn to the nuts and bolts. Uh, oh, uh, we need. I don't think we have any guests or anybody who is looking to comment on anything, do we? I have no comments um, or anybody prepared to make a comment. Hearing none. Let us move on. Um, do we have a Gabriel Rotor Smith and Company? Nope, that's me again. I, I've said enough. Okay, that's <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any need for retirement approvals or notifications? I am not aware of any. We don't have any right now, um, although we did just get a couple of requests. So the next board meeting, I anticipate we'll have a couple. Great. Thanks for that heads up. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll be in touch and we'll look at that as we get closer and put it on the schedule. Okay, let's look at the uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, Wendy, are you here? And uh, what do you have for us so we can continue on here? Um, Wendy is not here. Uh, Stephen Fraley is here from Innova, so I'll be okay, Stephen. presenting um, the performance report and then discussing our long-term outlook uh, for making some potential asset allocation changes to the portfolio. Go ahead. Great, let me share my screen and I know we're fighting a battle of time here. So I will spend just a couple of minutes um, reviewing performance for last year. Paul and Christy did a great job of reminding everybody of the really strong performance. Um, of course, we had uh, in 2019, 2020 and 2021. Unfortunately, 2022 was a challenge. Uh, with higher interest rates, um, bringing down both stocks and bonds throughout the year. Can everybody see my screen there? Yeah. Excellent. So quick performance summary. Um, in the quarter, fourth quarter of 2022, the portfolio is up about five and a half percent. Nice bounce back uh, compared to the first three quarters of the year, which saw negative uh, returns in each subsequent quarter. That brought the total calendar year performance for the defined benefit plan to minus 10.7% for the calendar year 
2022. Um, certainly a challenging year. Never like to see, you know, those types of losses. You know, down 10 and a half percent. But considering the the landscape, considering what what traditional stocks and bonds did, uh, we're pretty happy with that that result. Um, ending market value as of 1231. 37,179,861. Quick update, 2023 has been a strong start from both a, a stock and bond standpoint. Uh, so the portfolio is up about five and a half percent through yesterday to start 2023. So continued strong momentum um, that we've carried forward to the new year. Briefly looking at the allocation as of the end of the year, that's the table on the far right. You can see the asset classes listed, the total market value allocated to each of those areas, um, the current allocation as a percentage, and how that compares to the long-term target allocation. All in all, you know, plus or minus, you know, two percent roughly across all those different asset classes. So, I'm pretty happy with with where things are from an allocation standpoint. And to keep things moving, I'll just quickly touch on uh, the major indices. Of course, as I mentioned, difficult time frame. Uh, we finally did see some positive returns in the fourth quarter. Those are those blue bars that are actually above the line uh, for once in 2022. So strong bounce back across equities and fixed income. Unfortunately, for the full calendar year, you can see those green bars below the line. Equity markets down between 15 to 20 percent. Core bonds or just kind of traditional bonds down about 13%, which is, you know, the worst performance we've seen basically in bond market history. And then just to show a comparison of kind of what a traditional stock and bond portfolio did, a 70% stock, 30% bond portfolio was down about 17% in 2022. So I think, again, taking that back to the city's uh, performance down about 10.8%. Uh, pretty happy with those results and the 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 job that some of those alternative alternatives and diversifiers did in the portfolio. So in lieu yeah, of time, I'm going to skip forward a couple. Yep, sorry, do we have a question there? No, I just wanted to compliment you that you have met your goals of uh, not losing so much in a downturn and keeping what we've got. I'm very, very happy with this. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that perspective. And I, I know it's not, it's never easy to still see, you know, a 10% plus loss. But again, I think relatively speaking, considering what other parts of the market did, um, yeah. we're pretty happy with, with the results. So thank you for that, Bob. So moving forward, just again, kind of in lieu of time, we'll skip past some of the asset allocation and policy um, summaries because we will be talking about a new potential asset mix. So my apologies as we skip through to some of the, the kind of key fiduciary takeaways. Right here on the manager scorecard, there were a few um, changes throughout the quarter that I wanted to touch on. So again, this, this highlights any changes across management teams, personnel, um, performance concerns, any other concerns that might be popping up um, throughout the quarter. So you do see a few blue boxes there. Um, the first one there under people, three lines down, Harbor Capital Appreciation. Uh, this is actually pretty unfortunate. One of uh, the co-portfolio managers, Sig Sigalas, he's actually the founder of this strategy, actually passed away um, towards Ooh. the very end of last year. Certainly surprising to us. Um, there's still three other co-portfolio managers that are actually managing the day-to-day -day assets and making allocation decisions, but we certainly wanted to bring that forward as something that we will continue to monitor um, on a go-forward basis. So very shocking uh, and certainly sad news there and something we wanted to bring to the group uh, as a minor concern. Again, doesn't change our, our thoughts on the strategy, but wanted to bring that forward. Two other additional updates, um, asset base, which is about halfway over and about halfway down. You see a blue box for PIMCO. That's the dynamic bond fund. Um, they had a, a, a minor concern um, for asset flows. So they have seen some assets flow out of the strategy 
Actually, a lot of those have gone into kind of the, the flagship strategy called PIMCO Income Fund, which we may want to talk about here today. All in all, this strategy has done a, a great job from a performance standpoint, but did want to, to make note of, of some flows coming out of that particular um, investment. And then lastly, performance, that's the third column from the right, about a third of the way down, American Funds Euro-Pacific Growth Fund. Um, we did just, just downgrade that from a performance standpoint um, based on some recent performance, though we still think, again, this is a high conviction manager, and I'll talk a little bit. Really, they had some exposure uh, to emerging markets and China equities uh, specifically, which have hurt their performance in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, as a result, that's brought down some of the long-term performance looking back three to five years. Still, if you go out even further, seven to 10 years, um, still a really strong performer overall, but kind of part of our process and, 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 and going through this is if we do get to a point where we see performance start to underperform on a three and five year basis, we at least want to make sure we understand why, of course, and bring that to the committee's attention, but, but not recommending um, any changes at this time. Then skipping to performance, you know, I think quickly, just just high, very high level, mixed bag of performance. Um, of course, traditional stocks and bonds had a very challenging year. That's kind of the common theme and, and main takeaway across 2022. So you can see, you know, looking at the year to date column here um, across a number of the, the different strategies, for example, Dodge and Cox, that's a large cap value manager, was down about 7% in the year whereas the higher growth focused managers like Harbor Capital Appreciation were down significantly more. But of course, that's also why we allocate to these different managers um, very prudently um, and want to preach, of course, diversification. International managers, again, challenging year, kind of across uh, the international markets down between 17 um, and 27% in line kind of with, with their benchmarks. And then flipping to the top of the next page, you know, really kind of focusing on fixed income because uh, there are a, a couple of changes we are recommending as part of the asset allocation um, tweaks. So you can see three different managers that we're allocating to in fixed income, Dodge and Cox income, which is kind of the, the more primary core fixed income manager performed nicely compared to the benchmark down only 10.8 versus the benchmark, which is down 13. And then PIMCO Dynamic Bond Fund and JP Morgan Strategic Income both outperform quite dramatically. These two are very different managers compared to Dodge and Cox. Uh, they are much more defensive in nature, much more short term in terms of the, the underlying bonds they're purchasing. They also have a wider mandate, meaning they can kind of go um, a little bit broader in terms of the assets that they want to invest in and, and the underlying securities. So both of those held up quite nicely. So when you kind of roll all the fixed income, returns together down about 9.2% compared to the aggregate bond index or core bonds, which is down about 13%. And then really where we get into the diversifiers that did really well, um, relatively speaking, and really helped the portfolio from a performance standpoint, um, floating rate loans down about 2.4%. We are actually going to recommend getting out of this asset class um, entirely, primarily because these were really used as a protection against rising interest rates. We've seen rates come up dramatically. The, you know, the 10-year treasury went from 1.5% to nearly 4% today. Um, so we do think a lot of those you know, kind of interest rate risks have been mitigated. And so we are going to recommend actually getting out of the floating rate uh, vehicle and actually kind of reallocating those dollars across more traditional, um, higher quality fixed income. And we'll touch a little bit more on that briefly, but really the kind of the, the better performers, real estate, principal U.S. property fund up just over 4% during the year. If we flip to the next page, some of the other diversifiers that did well, Ironwood, which is the, the hedging strategy, um, really nice kind of calendar year down only 1.25%. Again, compare that to stocks and bonds. Other real assets that are more inflation sensitive and, and protect against inflation, midstream energy up 22%. Uh, diversified real assets up 4%, um, and then towards the bottom, private equity up uh, about 1.5%. So all in all, total portfolio performance down 10.7% for the calendar year. And then you can see uh, looking further out, 
uh, even with a really poor year, some of those longer term numbers, again, still look uh, pretty strong going back um, to 2005. So I'll just pause and see if there's any questions on the report itself. And then I'd love to spend, I know we only have, you know, 13 minutes here. We, I, I know everybody's got Valentine's plans and I respect that, but we want to go through kind of our outlook or at least a summary of our outlook and then talk about some potential small tweaks to the portfolio if that works for the remaining kind of 10 minutes or so. Does that, does that sound good to everybody? That's great. So I will move forward accordingly, but as a quick recap, I kind of mentioned this, but 2022, hard to recap, of course, in just a handful of bullet points. There was a lot of headline news, a lot of activity, but really the underpinnings of everything that we saw had to do with um, this inflation that had been building up in our economy as a result of um, you know, exponential government spending after the COVID crisis. This led to increased demand for goods and ultimately led the Federal Reserve to try to combat inflation by raising interest rates at the fastest pace in over 40 years. As a result, stock market saw its second bear market in less than three years, um, with global stocks ultimately falling about 18% in the calendar year. This also had a dramatic impact on the bond market as rising interest rates are generally a negative uh, for bonds, especially when they happen uh, as quickly as they did in 2022. So we saw the aggregate bond index fall 13% in the year, uh, which is th the most we've ever seen in modern bond market history by multiples. I think the worst previous bond market for a calendar year in modern history was down three and a half percent for the aggregate bond index. So almost four times uh, worse performance. The one silver lining was that diversification outside of stocks and traditional bonds did help mitigate risk. So again, those alternatives, some of the, the real estate, the other real assets and the hedging strategies uh, really did their job in 2022. Uh, quickly, just to reiterate that, this is looking at what we call the, the table, a, a periodic table of returns or investment quilt, and just shows different kind of patches on the quilt that represent different asset classes and the calendar year returns, again, kind of for, ranked from top to bottom across each of those. The one steady kind of you know stream here is that that diversified portfolio in black is kind of always in the middle from a return standpoint, never the best, never the worst. But when we look at that over long periods of time, what that means is that because that volatility has been smoothed out, it allows those returns to compound over long periods of time. And so looking to the right, you can see that diversified portfolio did about 7% per year over the last 10 years, second towards the top in terms of returns with volatility or standard deviation towards the bottom here uh, on the, the right-hand side. So that's the goal of diversification, of course, over time. It never feels great in the moment. Um, when stock market is, is roaring, your diversified portfolio is gonna fall behind. And even in years like 2022, you're still gonna probably see losses when there's a, a lot of bad markets. But when you look over long periods of time, that diversification really, really helps smooth uh, those those returns long term. And so quick summary of our outlook, again, looking forward, um, we think the risks of a recession have risen, certainly, um, as a result of substantial tightening by central banks around the world, though a lot of the information we're seeing coming out in terms of data, in terms of labor market, in terms of payrolls, um, are pointing to, you know, actually the possibility of kind of avoiding a recession. So you know, not sure when or if we'll go into one, but recessions are normal. They're part of, a, again, the normal economic cycle, um, and they ultimately do set the stage for the next period of growth. So I know that's certainly something uh, top of mind. The odds have increased. Again, we're not making any predictions, but we want to be prepared in case we do go into a recession and be ready for that rebound uh, when it happens. Um, we do believe that stocks anticipate a brighter future long before it becomes clear in economic news. So generally speaking, the stock market bottoms or hits a low point six to nine months before economic data kind of hits a low point and we see kind of economic um, data start to turn around. So we do recommend staying invested in equities and remaining diversified, you know, as, as we always have. Number three is probably the biggest impact on future returns. And that is we had a very painful bond market experience last year with rising interest rates. 
the one kind of positive that comes out of that on a go forward basis, bonds look much more attractive because interest rates are significantly higher. So we do have much higher uh, expected returns for bonds um, over the next five to 10 years. And then number four here, you know, we did talk about potentially here reducing hedging allocation and real estate allocation. In your particular portfolio, you have a lower allocation to hedge fund strategies um, at 10%. So we're actually recommending slightly bumping that up. This is more geared towards um, clients and portfolios that had you know 15 to 18%. We are recommending coming down closer to that kind of 12% uh, percent range. Um, the reason being is if you recall, the reason why we wanted to get into these strategies is to kind of outperform bonds over a full market cycle. Now that interest rates have come up, that ability to outperform you know, significantly has been reduced quite a bit. Um, similar to real estate, we are gonna recommend reducing real estate exposure um, from 7% where the current target is down to about 5%. So in lieu of time, I'm going to skip forward uh, a couple of pages. I think that, you know, the key when we look forward is still the fight against inflation. We're kind of seeing contradictory um, news flow out there. For example, um, we are seeing, you know, that inflation did peak in the U.S. And now the January year over year number came in at 6.4 percent off the high of 9.1 percent that we saw back in June. Um, but we're also dealing with a very tight labor market which could lead to kind of sustained um, higher wages uh, when we look at you know, worker um, compensation. So some challenges here, one of the, the stickiest components generally of inflation and the most resilient is wage growth because it's really hard to go back on wage growth unless there is a, a more severe economic outcome like a recession that would potentially reset a, a little bit of that, that labor force. So. Um, that's kind of the challenges that we are dealing with. Inflation certainly isn't a downtrend. We're continuing to see that, but still a long way to go to get to the Fed's 2% long-term inflation target, certainly. You know, one thing that we saw in 2022 is that equity valuations came down quite a bit. Really, that was just a result of prices coming down. Um, so it's kind of a reset uh, of valuation. So on a go forward basis now, equities uh, look a little bit more attractive than where they were certainly coming into uh, 2022. And then really the, the big impact I mentioned, bond returns, because interest rates are higher, we really do expect future returns to be much more attractive. And we do want to talk about potentially utilizing what we'd call a multi-sector bond manager um, to help take advantage of the market and take advantage of reduced interest rate risk. And so we would consider adding a new bond manager, PIMCO income fund, and potentially shifting some of the allocation of the current bond managers and the floating rate loan allocation that I mentioned uh, to this new manager and to other parts of the bond portfolio. So I know we're running up on time, so I'm gonna skip forward to spend the last few minutes on the actual study itself. And so again, I know, I think we've got a couple new faces since this time last year, but to reorient everybody, this is the asset allocation study for the city of Inglewood and focusing on the, the top left-hand side. This time last year, when we had this conversation, you can see the different asset classes list, listed from top to bottom. You can see the IPS column here, and then you can see the expected return of 5.41%. To earn that 5.41% over the next five to 10 years, you would have had to take some risk. In this case, you could experience a drawdown of up to 17% in any 12 month period. Again, that's the risk that you could potentially have to experience to earn that call at 5.5% per year. Again, this was what we were looking at um, coming into 2022. Fast forward to 2023. Based on equity prices coming down, valuations coming down, based on interest rates moving up and the future for bonds looking better, we've revised our expectations upwards, um, which also reflect, of course, a, a poor year in 2022. So for that same portfolio, if we shift to the right, that darker blue column that says IPS, same allocation you can see, we would expect that portfolio to now earn you know, closer to 7% with that same downside risk of a potential decline of up to 17% in a really bad uh, market environment. And then 
So what we've done from here is kind of show three different alternative mixes um, with varying kind of stock bond and alternative exposure. And I'd like to just kind of focus everyone's attention on mix one. I think that you know makes the most sense. It's very similar to the current uh, return expectation and risk of the current portfolio, but does include some of those slight tweaks that I mentioned um, previously. So the one thing that you'll see that's been completely omitted is floating rate corporate loans. We had in a 5% allocation. Um, we are again, recommending removing that allocation completely and really kind of spreading that out into domestic fixed income, adding a little bit to low correlated hedge and adding a couple of percent to private equity. So kind of really spreading that out across traditional fixed income, low correlated hedge and private equity. And so in doing so, if we look at mix one, you can see very similar return expectation um, with that same downside risk of 17%. So I think that's kind of our recommendation is to, to focus on that mix one. But I'd love to just pause here and see if there's any quite immediate reactions um, or concerns with that recommendation. And again, happy to talk more about our thoughts on floating rate corporate loans. Again, we kind of think they've done their job in a rising interest rate environment. Uh, as a reminder, those do invest in below investment grade quality bonds. So they do carry a little bit more risk. And now that interest rates have risen dramatically, we think it makes more sense to kind of spread that allocation around into other areas of the portfolio um, that we think are more attractive uh, going forward. Do we have any discussion, Jim? Uh, no discussion. I was ready to make a motion, Bob. Yes, go ahead. I move that we accept NFS recommendation for mix one for 2023. Do I have a second or any discussion? Uh, Bob, I do have a question for Steve. Quick question sure. yes. for yes. 2022 IPS. I didn't see large cap. But 2023 IPS, I saw 21%. How does that balance? Yes, I, I'm sorry, Jackie. I noticed that too. It must have gotten cut off on the reporting. Um, so our apologies. So that that is basically just uh, an error on um, the reporting formatting. So that 21% here, large cap equity is what Jackie's referring to, should be listed over here above the small cap. Uh, mid-cap U.S. So that's just a, a reporting issue. I, I apologize for that. I noticed that too, walking through. So thank you. And we'll make sure that gets corrected. Okay. Thank Jack you. Jackie, do you have any other comments? I mean, uh, my basic uh, uh, instinct is that this is the way to go. Uh, I'm thinking that you would probably see things that we might not. Uh, what is your reaction? Definitely, we want to listen to the professional. Um, if they had a uh, performance as we desire for 2022, we'll move forward with their recommend recommendation for 2023. Great. That That's my uh, thinking also. I, Jim, is your hand still up or... I'm looking for a second. To no, my, my right. hand should be down. <laughs> there it goes. Thank you. Wait, waiting for a second. Do we have a second? I will second it. Great. Jackie will second. Any further discussion? The All only the thing, oh, are. sorry. Nope, go ahead. Whoops. Oh, sorry, go ahead. sorry, sorry. I, I interjected. I mistakenly. Go fin fin finish your motion, please. My apologies. I got a little too antsy. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. <laughs> I'm getting antsy too. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is carried unanimously. Now, you may, you have the floor, Steve. Okay, just, I just wanted to take another 30 seconds. So as part of 
the the implementation and thank you for everybody's support of mix number one we did want to make some slight changes to the underlying managers within say fixed income um, i'm not sure if that needs a board approval or i can double check the investment policy statement to see if underlying uh, manager changes do require board approval or if InnoVest does have discretion there. So it would be within the domestic fixed income asset class. I mentioned the PIMCO income fund and I, we did include some materials. So I don't wanna spend the time. I know we're at the top of the hour, um, but basically we are recommending reallocating two of the existing fixed income managers the PIMCO Dynamic Bond Fund and the JP Morgan Strategic Income and reallocating those dollars, which make up about 3% of the portfolio um, into PIMCO income, which we believe in this environment uh, is a more prudent decision and, and can exercise their ability to see what they like in, in, the, in the bond market and, and make those allocation decisions um, themselves. So it's kind of a more of an implementation decision within fixed income itself. I, and I'm happy to send more information or follow up intra-quarter, whatever, again, you guys think is most appropriate. I don't want anyone to feel rushed. In looking over this, I think you have that discretion. Jackie, you may have more input into that, but, um, Right now, I would be uh, open to at least letting you proceed. And if we have to take a vote, maybe we could do it uh, remotely or something yeah. like that. Is that okay? Yeah, and, and we can follow up. So we can still move forward with the allocation change that was voted on to that mix one. And the implementation piece can always come later. So we can double check the investment policy statement and make sure right. of that. I don't want anyone to feel rushed and we, I'll follow up with an email um, and just stating, hey, here's the section of the IPS. It says we can or we can't. And then if we can't, we'll follow up and find the best way to resolve that. Great. Does that work? Great. Great. Okay, that's it from us then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I appreciate your consideration also. Uh, Let's see, do we have any old business? I don't think so. I think we've taken care of everything. Uh, any other discussion or issues that we need to look at? Rita? Thank you. I just have a, a question. Belinda Porter, I, I thought she was still supposed to be on the committee. Um, and we had changed the meeting to 4.30 because she cannot, I mean, she has to leave work early, but she can't leave any earlier than, than for, to be here by 4.30. Um, was there a reason that we changed back to 3.30 or was it only this one meeting? Well, I'm open to that, but when Jackie and I were discussing that, right now it's just for this one meeting, but Jackie's uh, told me that she did not reapply. And so she is no longer a member of the of the board. Did so, she get a notification? Yes, she did. In fact, I sent a follow up myself. So I don't know uh, what is going on. If you know her or are in contact with her, could you follow up or maybe talk to Jackie also about this issue? Jackie McKinnon? Yes. Okay, yes, I can talk to her. Are we still one person short? You no, know, I thought we were up to uh, our quota, but uh, I'm really not sure now that you mention it, if Rita's not our if uh, Belinda, Nita's not here. Okay. Okay. I will check with her, and then we'll just go from check there. Check with Jackie, and I will. I will check with her too, and we will okay. get this straightened out. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. To 
chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Thank you. And I appreciate all your considerations. Thank you very much. And with that, we are adjourned and happy Valentine's Day and hope you have a great evening and do something romantic. <laughs> bye bye. See you later. Thanks, bye. Bye. Appreciate it.